Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to our our first video lecture since classes were cancelled in this slightly unusual situation that we're experiencing this year. I hope everyone is well, and I'm looking forward to uh, finishing the course successfully uh, with you. Um, so please get in, in touch with me if there's any way I can help um, that happen. So in our video lectures last week, starting module four, we looked at interactive art and generative art, and we started to play with the processing environment for experimenting with generative art. And, you know, that's the still the best recommendation I can give to anyone um, looking to succeed uh, in the course, is to spend as much time as you're able playing um, with the various tools and approaches that we're putting in front of you. And what I want today is what I want to do today is to put another approach in front of you, um, the live coding approach, uh, and demonstrate some tools that you might use for that, um, because I think that that is another way to successfully complete the fourth project uh, in this course. There are lots of different live coding uh, tools out there. If you Google live coding tools or live coding or live coding languages, you'll find lots of interesting things to explore and. All of those are potential pathways for the project if you if you choose to explore them. Um, the pathway that I want to show you um, right now, I'm going to show you two pathways today. The first one um, is the punctual live coding language, which is actually a live coding language that I've made myself, uh, so I should be very familiar with it. And this live, live coding language, the punctual live coding language, um, has been made to work in a web browser uh, and this means that someone should be able to use it um, anywhere, for example, in schools or workshops without having to install software. There is one requirement, and that is that you have to, have be, you have to use the Chrome uh, web browser, or also the Chromium or Opera web browsers, if you have those too, are fine. And if you take the Chromium or Chrome web browser, and you go to dktr0.github.io, slash punctual, um, what you'll get will be this editor um, with this kind of cryptic looking program. And if you press shift enter after a second, the program will go. And the demonstration program in here in punctual is just a kind of a piece of pretty um, generative art. Um, this is the kind of thing we could maybe make with processing as well. Um, but we're gonna take this kind of thing in a slightly different direction um, because we're going to use this language and this environment as a place to do live coding. So what do we mean by live coding? Well, we really mean programming and sharing the act of programming with an audience as we do it. So um, we see this right away, even in this demonstration, in the punctual language, in the way that the pretty moving lines are being shared with us, but also the code is being shared with us on the same screen. So that's kind of a hint that this might be a live coding environment. Um, live coding is often done in performance settings where artists will make, make music, beats, sound art, other artists will make visual art to accompany that uh, while using powerful projectors to share both the code and the result with the audience in real time. So let's start um, by erasing everything and pressing shift enter again. And now we'll just have a black screen. And what I'm gonna do now is introduce you to the basics of Punctual so that if you want to explore a live coding performance with this environment for your fourth project, you um, have some good starting points. Um, so, Let's get started. So I'm gonna start, I often start these tutorials by drawing a circle. And then I wanna talk about what the, the numbers here mean. So this is a very simple program that I can type and then press shift enter to evaluate. And when I evaluate it, I see a white circle 
in the middle of the screen. And I'm going to write this program again a slightly different way. And this will produce exactly the same result, but it might be a little bit more clear to understand what's going on. So we've provided two numbers in square brackets here, separated by a comma. And the first one is the x position of the circle. And the second one is the y position of the circle, the up-down position of the circle. And this third number that's separated from the other two is how big the circle is. And in this case, we've given the value 0.25. Um, and so our geometry in Punctual always goes from minus 1 to 1. So in the x-axis, or left to right, minus 1 is the left side of the screen, and 1 is the right side of the screen. So 0 is halfway in between, and that's the center. And then in the y-axis, or up-down, minus 1 is the bottom of the screen, and 1 is the top of the screen and 0 is the middle again. So that's why when we give 0, 0 as the x and y position, our circle's in the middle of the screen. And 0.25 is in those same units. So this is like, if you look from the center of the circle to the edge, it's approximately a quarter of the distance to the edge of the screen. If I change this to 0.5 and I press Enter, I'll get a, a circle that's much bigger. And if I change it to 0.1 and press Enter, I'll get a circle that's much smaller. Now, before going much further with this, I want to highlight a difference between this environment and the processing environment that we've explored a little bit already. Um, I think you're seeing that when I'm making changes in this live coding environment, my changes are taking place very, very quickly. Uh, and that's definitely what we want for a live coding environment. In processing, which we were working with last week, I can certainly um, try to make changes very quickly. It's, it's certainly, like we talked about, it's a good idea to make little changes, to practice bricolage programming, where you make little changes, get some feedback, make another little change, get some feedback. But when you do that in an environment like processing that's not necessarily meant for live coding, it's always a little bit slower. Um, this is a live coding environment. It's meant for being used in live performance, perhaps in front of people. And so everything about it has been made to make it possible to make changes um, relatively quickly and have those changes update without any break in the performance. And so one thing we can do to, to show even further how this language is oriented towards live coding is we can put some crossfades on our changes. So if on the end of this line, I put the two angle brackets back to back like that, and a number, what this will tell um, the environment to do is to take 10, ten seconds to um, transition between the new and old versions. So I'm gonna change from this small circle to a big circle, and I'm gonna evaluate, and we're gonna see over 10 seconds that change take place. The new one is all just about faded in, and the old one is fading out. Okay, so far so good. So what if we want this circle to move? Um, I, before I get to that, maybe I'll move it around manually. So let's let's um, let's try some different numbers here. Like minus zero point five will be further to the left. There we go. I'm going to make our crossfade a little bit quicker so we don't see the old one for as long. And 0 0.5 would be higher up. And if we go to, oh, it gets a bit hard to see there now. If we go to 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5, it's going to be in the opposite corner. And maybe I'll make it small again. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start to make things move around now. So I'm gonna go back to our set our, our circle in the center. And now I'm gonna make the circle move. Um, by making it move, I might 
create interesting patterns. I might be able to accompany motion in music or dance. There's all kinds of reasons why we might be interested in making things move in this environment. So the simple way to make something move is to take a number, like the x position, which was zero, and replace it with an expression like this. And replace it with the expression sine one, and there's a space in between the n and the one there that's important. Um, so some of you might remember from, I don't know, math class or something like this, the idea of sine functions and trigonometry. Um, but what we really need to know about sine functions here, and, and perhaps this will recall some things we said in the audio module, is that they're, they are smooth circular motions back and forth around a middle position. And they have a frequency, in other words, how fast they move back and forth around the middle position. And so when we say sine 1, what that's going to be is going to be a number that's moving back and forth around 0. It's going to be going between minus 1 and 1 through 0 repeatedly, and it's going to do that 1 times per second. And so when we evaluate this, we'll start to see it. If you, if you look when it hits the left side of the screen and you kind of count, you'll see that one times per second the circle is going back and forth. I don't know how clear this motion is going to render on YouTube. Uh, sometimes when you do these kind of generative animations on YouTube, the compression messes it up a little bit. Uh, but if you type in the code yourself, you'll get a very, very clear representation um, of what's going on here. I could do the same thing in another dimension. Like what if, if at the same time as it was moving up and down, we had it moving, sorry, at the same time it was moving left to right, we had it moving up and down, but at a lower frequency, like 0.25. For a while we see the old one and the new one, but now we just see the new one. Making this regular um, spiral pattern. So that's already kind of an interesting thing. We've, we've, we've got two sine waves at different frequencies and they're controlling a circle that's being drawn and the result for us is a spiral and maybe this is a little example of what we talked about last week um, of emergence where the result surprises us in some sense we didn't literally ask for a spiral but we get a spiral what we perceive seems to be something over and above what we asked for i'm going to put some more um, decimal points in these numbers to slow everything down. And that's something I would say to everyone in general while you're experimenting with these things. It's, it's very easy to accidentally make things that move very quickly or that flicker a lot or that kind of thing. And that can be sometimes a little bit overwhelming for the eyes and the ears. So if, especially if you find yourself in that space, but even if you don't, you might think about slowing things down um, to create a situation where you can continue to work for longer. So I want to back up now and take th things in a slightly different direction as we learn more about this language. So I'm going to erase everything, evaluate so it's gone, and I'm going to start over again with our simple circle example. And this time, instead of having two numbers in the brackets, I'm going to put six numbers. And I'm just going to evaluate it, and then I'm going to talk about what it means. So when I did this, all of a sudden, the colors changed. And this is kind of surprising, but it, it's related to a very key aspect of the way this language works. So when we give circle more than two coordinates, what it does is it interprets each set of two coordinates as a separate circle, and each circle goes to a different channel of the output. And if we look over at this RGB that we've had there since the beginning, which we haven't talked about, now maybe it will be a little bit more clear what that means. Everything that we have on the left here of this set of arrows is being rooted to an output called RGB. 
And if you look in our circle things, our first set of coordinates, 0, 0. And that became this circle right here on the red channel. And our second set of coordinates was minus 0.5, so further to the left and 0. And that became this green circle. And finally, our last set of two coordinates was 0.5 and 0, and that became this blue channel. Um, so that's how that works. If we didn't want to have the separate colors, we could put all of this in brackets and then put the word mono in front of it and it'll mix those three channels down to one channel again and then the red, green, and blue will be all the same. When I evaluate that, now we're back to three white circles. But let's keep the colors because they're fun. So here's our colors. So the same thing that we saw a second ago with motion, we can do here now too. Instead of having these be fixed values, we could put sine waves in here at different frequencies. And just put a bunch of different sine waves so that we'll have three, our three circles all moving around in an interesting pattern. So I just pressed Control Enter to evaluate, and now I have my moving circles. And when the circles overlap, we get color mixing. And when they all three overlap, um, we see we see some some white. We could do something similar with the size of the circles. We have three circles, so we could put square brackets here, and then we could put three different sine oscillators in there for the size of the circle. Let's make them really slow. Like, no, it doesn't have to be too slow. Okay, what's gonna happen now? So our circles are kind of appearing and disappearing. And the reason they're disappearing is because our sine waves go back and forth between minus one and one. And so when they're below zero, um, you're drawing a circle that is smaller than zero. And so that's just nothing. So it doesn't, doesn't look like anything. What if we wanted these circles to, to go between being bigger and smaller like they are now, but not being quite as big as they are? Um, what we could do is take what we have here and multiply it by some number that's smaller than one to make it one-tenth the size. I'm going to multiply it by 0.1. Now some of you might be wondering when you look at this, isn't this going to multiply these two numbers first and then still give us a sine wave that goes between minus 1 and 1? Um, as it happens, no. In the rules of this language, if you have a function um, like sine, and then it takes an argument uh, or an option like 0.15, then those get combined first. And then only after that's been worked out do you get things like multiplication applied to it. So when we evaluate this, we're going to get much smaller circles now that are going to appear and disappear. And we're already doing bricolage programming here. Like I didn't really have a plan for how I was going to take this. I did not know I was going to be looking at these dancing circles 10 minutes ago. But by taking, um, you know, taking it step by step and looking at what I have in front of me and thinking about more changes that I could make, what I'm doing is gradually moving my way to more interesting results. And this process of bricolage programming, of gradually moving your way to more interesting results, the way that this translates into a live coding project is that you, you do this while you're practicing and you start to identify places that you want to go into a performance, it, places that you want to go during a performance. And really all you need to do to make a performance then is to, is to structure those things, like to think, how do I want it to start? How do I want it to be in the middle? How do I want it to end? And then you go and do that and you maybe improvise a few extra little changes as you go. Um, that's an idea I hope that we will we'll, we'll come back to. So there's something else I want to show you. Um, continuing from this example, a separate idea, a separate visual process that we can employ, and that's feedback. 
right now we're seeing our circles zipping around the screen and everything is being redrawn um, in every frame of the animation. The circles are in a different place and um, there's no connection from one frame to the next. Um, video feedback will let us have there be more connection from one frame to the next of the video. And there's a simple way of doing it in Punctual, which is just to give a number that's less than one, and then that arrow again that we saw used in front of RGB, and we assign that to the feedback parameter, FDBK. And what are we gonna see when we do that? And see, now we're starting to see these blurred trails from everything. Because basically what's happening is our output is all of the new drawing that we want to do plus all of what was there before times 0.9. So that's why we see these things that kind of fade away. They're, the drawing that was there before is redrawn again but slightly darker 90, at 90% of its, of its um, brightness. If we go up to more like 98%, things will stick around for a long time. And if we go even closer to one, we'll make things where they stick around um, maybe forever. Which would be a problem uh, if we weren't live coding. If it just stuck around forever, everything would, everything would, would saturate out at a white color. Um, but with live coding, it's no problem because we can just change the numbers to, to move back from an extreme result if that's what we get. So I don't know how well these graphics are rendering on YouTube, but what I'm seeing is kind of a pretty result. And it's generative art very much like we might have seen in our processing uh, tutorial. Uh, the difference, of course, is that there, there's far less code on the screen to create this, and we're seeing the code in the same space that we're seeing the result. There's definitely some emergence going on here, like I am just, my code is just about moving three circles around with some video feedback. But what we're getting is this kind of spiral pretzel-y pattern with things gradually fading away um, that surprises us in some sense. So it makes me want to try an experiment. What if I speed the circles up so I'm gonna get rid of all the decimal points here. So they're gonna move fast. It's gonna be a little bit more flickery, but maybe we'll get a different pattern. And what if I make them smaller? Instead of multiplying those expressions, controlling how big the circles are by 0.1, I'm gonna multiply them by 0.01. So they're very small circles indeed. We still see the spiral patterns, but now they look more like stars somehow appearing and disappearing in a night sky. All right, so I wanna back out from that and just quickly show you some of the other basic things we can draw and my plan for this is in the next lecture to show you some, uh, in the next lecture and maybe the one after that, to show you some more advanced things that we can do with these languages. And in particular, I want to, in a later lecture, show you how in these languages, processing, punctual, um, we can work with um, material like photographs that we have taken. Uh, because I think that's one way to make these projects um, more concrete and more original. Um, because you can start from photographic material that only you have access to, for example, because you took it yourself. Anyway, I'm gonna erase that, press shift enter. Um, so we can also draw lines and drawing a line looks like, looks something like this. Here's a line from minus 0.5, minus 0.5 to 0.5, 0.5 and it's, the line is this thick, 0 0.0002 thick. And if I put that to RGB, there is our line. And there's also I line or infinite line, 
um, which takes the same arguments, it takes the same pattern of numbers after it, but it draws an infinite line that goes through those points. So we can do some of the same tricks that we were doing a second ago with the circles. I'm going to go back to the line here. Here's the line. Instead of having those points be fixed points, we can have them be moving um, according to sine oscillators. And this is something like what's going on in that default example you get when you go here. Now we get this dancing line. I, I just love these dancing lines. And when you combine these dancing lines with photographic textures, like we'll do later, you get some really interesting results. We can make the thickness of the line also a function of some oscillation. We get some kind of interesting effects that way. And so something that I want to show going from this is what happens if we give multiple numbers to, um, to one of these oscillators. So I'm going to take the 0.5 here and I'm going to replace it with 0 0.05, 0.04, and 0.03 all in square brackets. And the square brackets here are important. So we've been using the square brackets for the last 20 minutes without really talking about what they mean. When we put something in square brackets in this language, we are making a multi-channel signal. It's not just one number, but a, a set of numbers. So this, for example, is a going to be a three-channel signal. And when I ask for when I give three frequencies to the function sine, what I get is three different um, sine waves. And so we're going to have um, stuff on the red channel. Its size is going to be affected by this number and stuff on the green channel its size is going to be affected by this number and stuff on the blue channel its size is going to be affected by this number let's try that out so the lines are always in the same place so So whichever one is bigger, I guess that's the one we're seeing, I think. So that's line and eye line and circle. Um, there's also rect for drawing rectangles. And this works a little bit differently than it does in processing. The, the first two numbers that we give are the center of the rectangle. And the second two numbers are the width and the height. So I'm going to make a rectangle that is wider than it is high here. And if I wanted to make a rectangle that was higher than it was wide, it might look like this. And we can do interesting things if we multiply different shapes together. Um, like if I take this rectangle and I multiply it by a circle, that is at the middle of the screen um, with a radius like this, I'll only see something where both the circle and the rectangle are not zero. And so I get this kind of like shape that is circular on one side and flat on another side. We can also do things like make a shape and subtract another shape from it. Now I'll get a rectangle with the circle carved out of the middle of it. Okay, so in a second I'm going to shift to something different, but before I do that, I want to just um, I think we've, we've completed our tour of the basics of punctual. I just want to quickly show you where you would go for documentation. If you go to this website here, and I'll give you a list of links at the end of this lecture, https github.com dktr0 punctual, and then you click where it says reference, 
you'll get a list of all of the functions that are available in Punctual. And there are many more things than the things I have talked about there. Uh, and we'll probably explore some of those in some later lectures. Um, what I want to do now is move to a different language. So still here in the Chrome browser, I'm going to point um, the browser to estuary.mcmaster.ca, which we saw earlier. Um, but now we know a little bit of Punctual, and so we may be able to combine that with some of the things we can do in, in Estuary. And I'm going to click on Solo Mode. And now I'm greeted with six panels, or five panels, where I can enter live coding um, programs. Um, <clears throat> and I can pick which language the programs are in. Um, earlier in the course, we did a little bit of mini title. Today, we did some punctual. And I want to come back to some mini title now, thinking about this as a way not of generating material for an audio project but as a way of doing a live coding performance for a fourth project in this course. So I'm going to make my font just a little bit bigger. And I'm going to work in this panel up over here in the right. And working now in the mini title language, I'm going to type S and then some quotation marks. And inside the quotation marks, I'm going to put a pattern. And I'm going to listen to that. I actually can't hear it. I think I have my settings wrong in the streaming software. Let me just fix that. Um, should already be hearing it. Well, I can't hear what I'm doing, although I think you can hear what I'm doing. Um, so I'm just going to have to stop this video recording for a second and make a second video, continuing where we left off. So see you in a second. <laughs>